so now that, but that was only in germline and somatic BRCA, maybe, you know, 25%, uh, uh, maybe, you know, two thirds of those or three quarters of those are, 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 are germline. We want to do beyond BRCA and, and clearly PARP inhibitors work beyond BRCA. We've shown that in the, re, in the recurrent setting. So there's a, a now a, th a third study also published in the New England Journal, uh, 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 Gonzalez Martin, it's called Prima. Uh, Tom, tell us about Prima and what the opportunity is here beyond BRCA. Sure, Brad. Thank you. Uh, you know, also known as uh, GOG3012, right? So we mm -hmm. can't forget that. So this compared maintenance niraparib uh, to placebo. Um, and then niraparib was uh, given in his maintenance for 36 months in this trial after completing primary chemotherapy. Eligible patients had stage three um, with gross residual disease after primary surgery or stage four disease. Um, and it included patients that had neoadjuvant chemotherapy as well. So both serous and endometrioid were the histologies that were included in this, importantly, to be eligible. Uh, and you had to have a response either partial or complete uh, to previous chemotherapy. Importantly, too, and Brad, you've shown this with your weights and plates uh, work in the past in terms of the impact on especially thrombocytopenia. For those patients that, that uh, had a platelet count uh, at less than 150,000, or that, that weight less than 77 kilograms, you actually reduce the dose. And that happened about two thirds through this trial. So that's important in terms of interpreting some of the, the uh, 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 toxicity data. Um, the patients were randomized two to one. There were 733 patients that, that were randomized in total. Um, and importantly, that they used the, the hierarchical step down um, in terms of the statistics. Uh, they, they actually did stratification based on whether you did neoadjuvant chemotherapy or not, what, what the uh, HR status was, um, and whether you had a CR or a PR. Those were the three stratification factors. So the primary endpoint in this was homologous recombination deficiency, and we can get into discussing what exactly that is and what that means. But the primary endpoint was the HRD population and so if that's positive, then they're able to go on to the other populations. And the second population they looked at was the entire population. It was the intent to treat population. So that's important to understand. The primary endpoint that they used within these groups or cohorts was uh, progression-free survival as determined by Bicker. So they had blinded independent central radiologic review to determine if you actually had progression or not. So in their first assessment, if you will, for the, that group that had the HRD, they found a significant improvement in the median. The PFS was 21.9 months for the group that received niraparib, and it was 10.4 months for the group that had placebo. The hazard ratio uh, was very impressive, uh, 0.43, so there was a 57% reduction in the hazard of either relapse or death. If you look at it by the intent to treat population, um, Still impressive, 13.8 versus 8.2 on the medians with a hazard ratio here of 0.62. So that's all comers that are in this study. And again, the phase three patients, remember, had to have residual disease. So uh, a fairly difficult group. So when you're looking at the medians, you have to be cognizant of what the patient population was. And then there were a number of subgroup analysis that were looked at as well, getting to what Katie just talked about if you look at the BRCA group, uh, you're down into the 0.3 range. Um, if you look at and break it out, Brad, you had data at SGO uh, this year, um, looking at BRCA1 versus BRCA2. BRCA1, a little higher hazard ratio, 0 0.39, a little lower, 0 0.35 for our BRCA2 population. Um, if you, and then if you pull out the BRCA and look at just the HRD, uh, your hazard ratio is still impressive, 0 0.5. So that's interesting. And then if you look at your HR proficient, you still had a positive hazard ratio. The, the, uh, it did not cross one. And the hazard ratio was 0 0.68. So very impressive in terms of what you're seeing with this data. Now, the medians there were not very different. I think the difference was about 2.7 months. So you sort of have to put that in, into you know, what, how important do you think that, that difference is. 
I don't think there were any uh, significant new safety signals um, from this trial. Uh, you continued to see uh, anemia, uh, nausea, thrombocytopenia as the big three, uh, largely um, grade one and two, but you still had 28% uh, uh, nausea that was grade three or higher. Um, and in terms of thrombocytopenia, it, it definitely dropped down uh, the, the, um, um, the, the amount a little bit, but you still saw a significant amount of, of grade three or higher uh, that was present uh, at tw about 29%. So still saw some of those uh, safety signals that were the same. So what does this mean, Brad? I think it means that uh, you have a patient population here that you could argue um, you could use a PARP in any of these subpopulations. And Katie and, and the rest of the panel, I'd love to hear about these, these subgroup analysis that really aren't powered and what that means. And, and I think people have different interpretations of that and what it means and how they're gonna apply it clinically. But I do think many people are gonna look at these data and, and say, why wouldn't I use it on everyone? Right, so I, I wanted a comprehensive answer and that was, and, and, and the impact of this, this study deserves really a comprehensive assessment as you just did. I, I'm not gonna debate yet, we will, whether <laughs> HRD testing should be performed. <laughs> 